C'est un, un honneur et un très grand plaisir de présenter euh, Margaret Livingstone, professeure de neurobiologie à l'école de médecine de l'université de Harvard. En tant que scientifique, Margaret grandit à Harvard même dans le laboratoire de David Hubel et Thorsten Wiesel, qui partagèrent en 1981 le prix Nobel euh, de physiologie et médecine pour leurs travaux sur le développement et la neurophysiologie du système visuel. En mesurant au moyen d'un microélectrode inséré dans le cortex de primates et de chats, l'activité des neurones individuels, Hubel et Wiesel ont fait énormément progresser nos connaissances sur la manière dont le cerveau détecte des formes, des mouvements, des orientations, en somme, comment le cerveau construit le monde tel que nous le voyons. Je mentionne Thorsten et Wiesel car ces lignes de recherche sont celles que Margaret Livingstone va prolonger combinant le célèbre microélectrode avec des technologies plus récentes comme l'imagerie par résonance magnétique fonctionnelle pour étudier des processus plus complexes dans le cerveau du primate tels que les traitements des visages au niveau neuronal. C'est sur ce terroir expérimental fertile qu'on poussait les travaux de Margaret sur les relations entre l'art et la perception visuelle ou plus précisément sur l'art et les sciences de la vision en tentant d'utiliser ce que nous savons sur la vision et ses mécanismes neurobiologiques pour comprendre certains mécanismes contribuant à la création et à la perception des œuvres d'art. Outre un certain nombre d'articles, l'engagement de Margaret Livingstone dans ce domaine a abouti à un livre remarquable intitulé « Vision and Art, the Biology of Seeing », publié en 1902 et réimprimé cette année pour la seconde fois en une version revue et augmentée. Ces travaux, il faut le dire, n'ont pas laissé les critiques tout à fait indifférents. Des neurobiologistes ont contesté la division du système visuel, dont nous entendrons sûrement parler, en un système ancien spécialisé dans la localisation des objets dans l'espace et un système plus évolué permettant l'identification des objets. Et certains conservateurs et historiens n'ont pas apprécié les hypothèses de Margaret, dont peut-être nous entendrons aussi parler, sur le possible rôle du strabisme dans l'histoire de l'art. J'espère que sa conférence d'aujourd'hui euh, ne nous laissera pas indifférents à nous non plus et qu'elle sera non seulement savourée, mais aussi discutée. Let us then welcome Margaret Livingstone. Margaret, the floor is yours and don't forget. That's right. If you don't have glasses, raise your hand. So I apologize for not being able to speak French. I feel bad about this, but I cannot, so I have no idea what he just said. So I'm a visual neurophysiologist, which means I try to figure out how we see by recording from neurons at various stages in the visual system. But I acknowledge that artists also try to figure out how we see, and many works of art are great because they reveal important things about how we see. Now, I know that there are many works of art that are considered great or aesthetic because they reveal important things about how we think or about human culture, but I'm not going to deal with those kinds of works of art because I work on low-level vision. And please note that the title of this talk is What Art Can Tell Us About the Brain, not What Neuroscience Can Tell Us About Art. I don't presume to do that. So artists have known for a very long time that, and lights up for these first few slides, okay, that, that a line drawing can be a perfectly good representation of the world. And it's so intuitive and so universal that you have to think for a minute to realize that the world is not full of lines. It's full of contours and discontinuities, and yet we automatically accept a line as a representation for a contour. And the reason we do this is because of the way our visual systems process light. Steve Kufler discovered that if you shine a spot of light on the retina, you get a barrage of signals from retinal ganglion cells. But to his surprise, he discovered that when he shined a larger spot of light on the retina, he got a worse response. That's paradoxical because there's more light shining on the retina. But Steve figured out that that's because retinal ganglion cells are excited by light in one part of the visual field but they're inhibited by light in the immediate surround. So when he shined an annulus of light on the retina, he got a suppression of firing. So center surround antagonism, this, what this is, 
inhibition by the surround is the most fundamental stage in visual information processing. This is opponency or lateral inhibition. And in case you don't believe me that your visual system is full of center surround cells, I hope you see the little gray spots at all the intersections wherever you're not looking. And don't worry about why it's where you're not looking that's postgraduate. But you see the little gray spots at the intersections because center surround cells at the intersections have more white in their inhibitory surround than center surround cells at the cross pieces. So they're less active. So they look a little bit darker. And there's an extra synapse involved. So there's a tiny delay in generating the surround antagonism, which is why you see this temporal pattern to the little gray dots that aren't there. So if I convey anything to you. It's that vision is information processing, not image transmission. It doesn't do you any good to project an image up to the back of your brain because there is nobody up there to look at an image. All you have up there is neurons, and all they can do is fire or not fire, which means that visual information processing is simple. All they are is neurons. All they can do is fire or not fire. They're local because neurons are short. And they're often opponent. That is, they often show surround opponency. So if you have an image like this, white on one side, dark on the other, center surround cells over here are inhibited, center surround cells over here are not active, it's only center surround cells at the discontinuity where there's an imbalance between the center and the surround where you get a signal. So center surround cells turn a contour into a line drawing. And this is just to remind me how information rich a line drawing can be. But it also allows me to point out, and this is where I want the lights up. Can we do that for just a second? So what color are these lines? This is easy. Come on, black. Can we say black? But what color is the screen? Can we, can we say white? <laughs> But I hope you know that the amount of light coming to your eye from the black line is the same as the amount of light coming to your eye from the white screen, right? Because that projector can only project light, right? So that just illustrates that your visual system is not interested in how much light there is at any point in the visual scene. All it's interested in is contrast. And your visual system does map the, the world onto primary visual cortex. So there is a map of the visual world across primary visual cortex. So as you march across visual cortex, you march across visual space. So because all long range connections in the cortex are excitatory and all inhibitory connections are local, that means that Inhibition is local in cortex. So as you march across cortex, because you're dealing with nearby parts of the visual field, inhibition in the cortex is local in visual space, which gives you all kinds of local inhibition or surround antagonism. I told you about surround antagonism in luminance, and now we could have the lights down just a little, or at least not off the screen. Perfect, thank you. So all these gray disks are identical. I know they don't look identical. They don't look identical to me, but they are. I know it because I made them. It's the background that's graded. So the disk that's in front of the dark background looks lighter, and the disk that's in front of the light background looks darker. That's surround opponency in luminance. Here's surround opponency in contrast. These checks are identical, but these look higher contrast than these because these are surrounded by high contrast and these by low contrast. Orientation is locally opponent. This centered disk is vertical, but it looks off vertical because of the surrounding orientation. Motion is locally opponent. That red dot is moving vertically, but it looks like it's moving off vertically because of the surround opponency in motion. Color is locally opponent. So all these rings are identical. They're the same gray. I know they are because I made it, but they don't look the same to me. These look more blue or less yellow. These look more yellow or less blue because of surround opponency in color. And here's a little demonstration of surround opponency in color. If you look at that little black dot for just a second and keep in mind that you're seeing white letters, I hope you see a 
yellow after image from white letters because of the surround opponency in color. And of course artists know this. Monet painted a blue shadow with yellow surrounds. So the computations are simple and local and opponent, even for something that seems like it ought to be global, like depth perception. So you look out on the world and it looks vividly three-dimensional, right? You look out on the world, it looks vividly three-dimensional. Now, I know that the world is three-dimensional. I'm not denying that. But the fact that you see it as vividly three-dimensional, you're doing this with two flat retinal images. That's all the information your brain gets about distance and depth is two flat images. And from these two flat images, your brain has to compute distance and depth. So we use a lot of cues to compute this. We use relative motion, so when you move, things that are near move more than things that are far. We use shading, perspective, and occlusion, which artists take advantage of, and we use stereopsis, which I'll get to at the end. But even though distance and depth is global, we still do it with local opponent neurons. And you can pay a lot of money for what's called a ray tracing program for computer graphics that calculates using the laws of physics, how light ought to bounce off of three-dimensional objects, and all people in computer graphics think that you have to do this. But your visual system does not go around checking to make sure the laws of physics are being obeyed. You don't have to. It's pretty well guaranteed that the laws of physics are going to be obeyed. And artists, for centuries, have ignored the laws of physics, and no one cares. When artists first started using shadows, they would sometimes have shadows going in orthogonal directions. No one cares. Here's a vase of flowers with a shadow going towards the sun. This is Canaletto's Piazza San Marco. The shadows on this side of the piazza are going this way. The shadows on this side of the piazza are going that way. The curator at the Fogg Museum, when I mentioned this, said, oh, that's because the light is coming from here and bouncing off this building. So I went to the Piazza San Marco. This thing is full of windows, it's just columns and doorways. Light does not bounce. There is no time of day in which the shadows go in different directions in the Piazza San Marco, and no one but me cares. Here's a window where this thing doesn't cast a shadow where you'd think it ought to. Here's a manger where you see the roof from above over here, from below over here. No one cares. Now, I don't contend that halos should obey the laws of physics, but at least they should be internally consistent in whether they occlude or not. And of course, Magritte was playing with the laws of occlusion. And if you find a painting that's got a mirror in it, you can go through the Louvre, you will find hundreds of paintings with mirrors in them. Every single one of them is not obeying the laws of physics. If this lady were looking at herself, you, the viewer, would not see her face, right? And even Vermeer, he paints this nice shiny brass bowl and it looks shiny because it's sitting on a tablecloth and it's reflecting the tablecloth. But if you look carefully at the bowl, what it's reflecting has nothing to do with the tablecloth underneath it. So something else that artists figured out long before us neuroscientists are that color and luminance, and don't worry, I'm going to define luminance, color and luminance do different things for an artist, for the viewer. So we have three cones long, middle, and short, red, green, and blue. We see color by comparing or using opponency between pairs of these cones. We see luminance by simply summing the output of the three classes of cones. So this is the color version. This is the luminance version. Most color contrasts have a luminance contrast, but some color contrasts do not have a luminance contrast. And when you achieve that situation, something very special happens. And artists have worked with this for a long time. If you go out to the marmitan, oh, it didn't work very well. You have to go to the marmitan. It's easy for you. It's not so easy for most people I talk to. In Impression Sunrise, the sun is brilliant. It shimmers. It looks light. It looks dark at the same time. And I once got a small grant from Harvard to go to come to Paris and measure the luminance in Impression Sunrise. And it turns out that, and that's not easy to do, 
it turns out that even though the sun, which should be a source of light and should be brighter than the background, is actually exactly the same luminance. And I think it's because it has no luminance contrast that it looks so peculiar and has this wonderful shimmery quality. And that's because your visual system, the primate visual system in general, takes in light through the retina, projects it up to primary visual cortex, but then our visual system splits into these two major processing streams. And we know what these two processing streams do because of what happens to people who get lesions in various parts of them. So people who get lesions in the ventral processing part of their stream lose the ability to recognize objects. They can look at an object, they can grasp it, but until they grab it, they can't tell you what it is. Those are called the agnosias, and you can lose surprisingly specific kinds of object recognition. So we call that the what pathway because it tells us what is there. Then there's the more dorsal pathway. So this part of our visual system is unique to primates among mammals. So this is a primate add-on to the basic mammalian visual system, which we share with other mammals. So this part of our visual system does what a visual system needs to do. It allows us to navigate through our environment, to grab things, and to see things that are moving. And it carries information about motion, depth, spatial organization, and figure ground segregation. Here's some drawings made by patients with parietal lobe lesions. They were asked to draw a bicycle, a bicycle, a cross, and a clock. So you can see that these patients got all the bits right, but the bits are not in the right spatial organization. They look sort of like cubist drawings. Now this is not to say that Picasso had a parietal lobe lesion, but rather that Picasso cottoned on to the idea that what and where are two distinct things. So this evolutionarily old part of our visual system is, like other mammals, colorblind. So if you have a red spot on a green background, you take a black and white photograph of it, or you look at it with just your wear system, you'll see a gray spot on a gray background. And you could imagine that you could change the brightness of the red in such a way that the two grays were identical. That's equal luminance or equal value for the artists in the audience. And weird things happen at equal value because there's a whole part of your visual system that can't see them. And for me, with this particular projector, this one has that weird shimmery quality, and this one does. So I want to try to convince you that your ability to see depth, spatial organization, and figure ground segregation are carried by a colorblind part of your visual system. And to do this, I need the lights off because I have to make this thing brighter. OK, so I hope you can see that this thing is three-dimensional, right? It looks three-dimensional. It's not. We all know this, right? And it looks three-dimensional whether the red is brighter than the green or whether the red is darker than the green. But as I go through equal luminance, I hope you see this thing get flat and squishy. And then it looks three-dimensional again. Let's go through flat and squishy. See? There it goes. And then it's three-dimensional again. So I hope you saw your ability to see depth from relative motion go away at equal luminance. Now, if we could have the lights up just a little, and those of you who did not get the glasses, could I have the lights up a little bit? Now, raise your hand if you don't have the glasses, and because some people see. I knew there'd be people without glasses. Don't, don't use them yet. Just make sure you have them, OK? Now, without the glasses, you can see that there's a lot of information about depth from perspective and depth from shading in this image, but I hope if you close one eye and look through the red lens, this looks more three-dimensional. Close one eye, look through the red lens. You're looking through the blue lens. Good. Thank you. So I hope it looks more three-dimensional when you, when you, when you block the blue light and, and introduce a luminance contrast. Now put the glasses down. Come on, down. And now, without the glasses, think about how three-dimensional this looks, depth from perspective, 
Think about even the figure ground segregation in this complex image and then close one eye and look through the red lens and see if it doesn't look more three-dimensional. And it makes sense. You get figure ground segregation. OK, glasses down. You have to do that. Humor me. Monet painted a whole bunch of versions of this cathedral in Rouen. And they're all about the way light bounces off this three-dimensional building because uh, it's all beige stone. And you see the doorway and the rose window. And it's all the, all the depth is there in the luminance version. Some of the versions he made of the cathedral are flat and shimmery. So this one we have in Boston at the MFA. It looks flat and shimmery because the building faces west, and this is the cathedral at sunset. And Monet achieved this flat, shimmery effect using pairs of colors that are equal luminant, equal value. R Lichtenstein made a bunch of versions that he called the Rouen Cathedral. No glasses? Mm, stop. He called this the Rouen Cathedral, and you can't even tell that it's a cathedral unless you close one eye and look through the red lens, and then you will see what Lichtenstein was doing. OK, glasses down. Andy Warhol played with this. This is uh, the bottom half of a poster, uh, a silk screen of the Brooklyn Bridge, and it doesn't look really very much like the Brooklyn Bridge. But the top half, which is exactly the same image, but with a luminance contrast, does look like the Brooklyn Bridge. And there's a lot more depth in the top version than in the bottom version, even though it's exactly the same image. And I found this one on the web. If you were my age, you would recognize it. And, but you wouldn't really be able to tell what or who that was. But the top version you can see is Gracie Slick, for those of you whose grandmothers remember Gracie Slick. So I hope I've convinced you that your ability to see depth from shading, depth from perspective, are colorblind. So it shouldn't matter what color you use as long as the luminance is appropriate. And of course, artists figured this out. This is Andre Durand's portrait of Matisse. If you knew Matisse, you'd recognize him instantly from the shape of his face, even though the shadows are very peculiar colors. And that's because. Even though the shadows are peculiar colors, the luminance is exactly right to portray the shape of Matisse's face. And Matisse's lady in a hat, which got everybody all upset when he first came out of it, he's doing what Picasso said. He's using colors symbolically, but the reality is there in the luminance alone. So I hope I've convinced you that your ability to see Depth, spatial organization, and figure ground are colorblind. Now I want to try to convince you that your ability to see motion is also colorblind. So I'm going to show you some stripes. If I can find my pointer, there it is. So the stripes are all clearly moving at the same speed. And you can cheat if you want and look at the center. But I'd prefer, if you want to see the illusion, that you look off to this side. And now I am going to show you that the stripes seem to be moving at the same speed if the green is darker than the red. And they seem to move at the same speed if the green is brighter than the red. But if I can get this close to equal value, which for me is right about here. Oh, there we go. If you're not looking at the center, I hope they seem to be moving slower on the left than on the right, because they are a whoops, too dark. Suboptimal stimulus for your motion system. So if your ability to see that something is moving is colorblind, your ability to see that something is stationary is colorblind. So Monet's poppies are just about equal luminant with the grass. So their position is indeterminate. They can seem to move in the breeze. Now, art historians carry on about the motion in Monet's paintings. But I don't know if Monet did this deliberately. I have no way of knowing. But I know that Mondrian did this deliberately because the title of this painting is Broadway Boogie Woogie. He knew he had achieved a sense of motion. And I think he achieved a sense of motion because the yellow checks are vividly apparent to your what system, but they're almost invisible to your where system because they're equiluminant. Advertisers do this all the time. We have a magazine in the US called Wired Magazine. I don't know what the equivalent is here, but it's kind of a. Uh, oh, good. OK, you have Wired. You open Wired magazine, you will find a headline or an ad in there that's got text that's one color against an equiluminant background. And it's annoying. 
It's hard to read, but it gets your attention, and that's what the advertiser wants to do, and I think it gets your attention because it has this jumpy, jittery quality because your wear system can't see it. So I hope I've convinced you that your ability to see motion, depth, spatial organization, and figure ground segregation are colorblind and calculated locally in early visual cortex. Now I want to try to convince you that your ability to see colors is low resolution. And of course, artists know this. Pastel artists, watercolor artists often make an outline where they apply a color that doesn't they don't color inside the lines. You don't have to because your visual system accepts the color because of the low resolution of your color system as adhering to those outlines. So here's an illusion based on that. I hope you see the donut. Do you know what I mean by donut? The donut as yellower than the whole or the background. It looks yellow, right? It's not. I, I mean, I see it as yellow too, but I know it's not because I made this, that the donut is exactly the same white as the whole or the background. These are just two sets of lines, two pairs of lines, a yellow line in, inside a purple line. And the yellow spreads in, in, in this case, in this direction, in this case, in this direction. It spreads until it hits a border because of the low resolution of your color system. Your color system lets the color spread till it hits a border. So I wanna use some after images to show you color spreading till it hits a border. What I want you to do while I go through these after images, while I go through these images is I want you to look right at that intersection, okay? And then I'm gonna show you an achromatic gray background, okay? Now, look at the intersection and see if this time you don't see a stronger after image. Now, some of you are thinking, well, of course I did. You did it twice. No. Look at the intersection, evaluate the after image. Look at the intersection, evaluate the after image. This is achromatic, by the way. Now, look at the intersection and see if that color can spread to fill a completely different shape. And look at the intersection and see if you can see the color just squirt right out the hole. So this is... I can't believe I'm talking about the Mona Lisa in Paris, but I'm gonna anyway, okay? This is a very famous painting. It's hard to get near it, it's so famous. But there, so I wrote this book about vision and art. And while I was writing this book, my editor said that it was obvious I knew a lot about vision, and that's true, but it was equally obvious I knew nothing about art history, and that's also true. And he told me I had to read a book about art history. So I got this book called Gombrich, which is a very good art history book, and I, but I only got to the Renaissance because I got to this part, and Gombrich says, there's a reason why everybody loves this painting. As you look at it, she seems alive. Her expression seems to change as you look at the painting. So I want you to see if, so I looked at it, and I thought, wow, he's right. And, Leonardo, and um, Gombrich says that what Leonardo did was use sfumato, which means he made it blurry, and that therefore her expression is ambiguous. But see if you don't see what I see. Look at her eyes and think about her mouth. So you have to keep track of where you're looking, right? Now look directly at her mouth and think about how much she's smiling. And look back and forth between her eyes and her mouth, up and down, up and down and see if you don't find that her expression changes systematically with where you're looking. Now that's not because of the ambiguity, because ambiguity ought to be a cognitive thing, right? It ought to be depending on your state of mind, not where you're looking. That's really low level, but I am a low level visual physiologist and I know that your acuity falls off from the center of gaze. So if you're looking at that dot, all of these letters are equally readable. That's how much your acuity falls off from your center of gaze. Your central vision is very good at seeing tiny detailed things, but your peripheral vision isn't just bad. Your peripheral vision is actually better at seeing big blurry things. So if you filter the Mona Lisa in such a way that you see what she would look like to your peripheral vision versus what she'd look like to your central vision, if you could see the whole thing with your central vision all at once, 
she's smiling here, she's not smiling here. So as you move your eyes around this painting, and you have to move your eyes constantly, you move your eyes three times a second, because your visual system isn't interested just in spatial contrast, like I already told you about, but temporal contrast as well. So if things don't change, if there's no contrast, you don't see. So you constantly move your eyes around. And I think that can explain why her expression changes, because sometimes you're seeing her mouth with your peripheral vision, sometimes with your central vision. And it also explains a kind of coy quality. You're looking at the background and she seems to be smiling and now you try to catch her smiling by looking right at her and she stops. The pointillists claim that the vibrant quality of their colors is because of additive color mixing. But I think it has nothing to do with additive color mixing. Magazine illustrations are made up of little dots of color, and there's nothing special about the colors in magazine illustrations. Instead, I think the vibrancy comes from the fact that your central vision sees the dots. Your peripheral vision sees the boats, the river, the trees. So as you move your eyes around the painting, you see different things. And that's vibrant. That's dynamic. And in this boat scene, if you look right at this reflection, you see dots. If you look a little bit farther away, you see lines. If you look still farther away, you see a solid reflection. And that's exactly what real water does. Sometimes it's dots, sometimes it's lines, sometimes it's a solid. Chuck Close carries this to ex an extreme. With your central vision, you see the targets, the tiles. With your peripheral vision, you see Chuck Close. Photo mosaics, with your central vision, you see baseball cards. With your peripheral vision, you see Babe Ruth. So now I want to talk a bit about higher vision. We're getting past primary and second visual cortex up into the temporal lobe where we recognize objects. We are really good at recognizing objects. We, we are so good, I have to explain to you how hard it is to see. So my government has spent billions of dollars trying to make trucks that can drive and not fall off the road without a driver or face recognition systems and we have wasted all these billions of dollars. So you're really good at recognizing faces. You're detecting faces in a tenth of a second, and you're even recognizing particular individuals. And you're doing this whether they're cartoons or caricatures or degraded, and you're doing it better than any computer program that our DARPA has spent billions of dollars trying to make. So how do we do something as difficult as recognize a face? Faces are quite similar one to the other, and yet we're incredibly good at discriminating them. Of course, artists knew something about how we must do this long before us neuroscientists had any idea of how it's done. It is easier to recognize a caricature than to recognize a veridical line drawing of an individual. The caricature physically is less similar to that person's face than a, than a real line drawing, yet the caricature evokes that individual so well. Why does it do that? So we have special domains in our brain for recognizing faces. We know this because people can get lesions in their temporal lobe, part of the what system, and lose the ability to recognize faces but still be able to recognize all other kinds of objects. And you can see in functional MRI that we have these special domains for recognizing faces. Monkeys also have these specialized domains, and monkeys like humans, use faces to recognize conspecifics and to convey important social information. So we've recorded from the face domains in monkeys. So face cells in monkeys respond, that is, they signal in response to monkey faces, people faces, or even cartoon faces. So anything you'd call a face, a monkey face cell will respond to. So we have recorded from these cells, and we use the fact that they respond to cartoons to say, well, what do they care about? What does a face cell care about? So we, we developed a cartoon face set that, in which we varied everything we could think of about faces, from the mouth to the nose to the eyes to the hair. We varied everything we could think of, and we did it simultaneously and recorded from these cells. So if 
each face cell codes one face, we would never have found anything. Instead, we found that face cells did respond to this stimulus set. And you can see that we went to extremes in our different variables. And we meant to do that because we wanted to get outside of what the, vari what the cells coded for. And we did find that face cells respond to these variables. So all the variables were changed simultaneously. And here are each row is one face cell. Each column is one of those variables. So this is the size of the iris. Both these cells like big irises. This cell likes big inner eye distance, no, small inner eye distances, and so on. So you can see if you can read these graphs. So the gray part is just chance. That's random firing. And if you go outside the gray part, the cell cares about that parameter. And so you can see that each cell cares about a few of these different variables, but they're different variables for different cells. So that means that face cells are coding face parameters, face features, and they're coding different overlapping constellations of face features. So we did have cells that cared about inner eye distance, and you might imagine that if you had a cell, if you wanted to code inner eye distance, you'd have different cells that would peak at different inner eye distances so that you could recognize everybody who had different inner eye distances. Or you could have one cell that peaked its firing at really big inner eye distances and then another cell that peaked at really small inner eye distances, that is ramp-shaped tuning. And you get everything in between for free this way just by the ratio of these two. And as you can tell by looking at this cell, it peaked at large inner eye distances and was inhibited at low inner eye distances. And so you can see that all the significant tunings were ramp shaped. That is, the cells responded to extreme values of each variable that we showed it. And that's why I mentioned that we went way outside what we thought would be reasonable values. So ramp shape tuning is consistent with caricatures. What's a caricature? You say, how does a face differ from the average face? And then you exaggerate that difference. Face cells are essentially taking a caricature of a face because they measure how that face differs from the average. And of course, artists know this. Artists have been drawing caricatures for thousands of years, even somebody like Picasso. So Picasso portraits look strange, but I've put each of these portraits next to the person they're a portrait of, and you can see that they're caricatures. Gertrude Stein, Picasso himself, his art dealer. We got wife, 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 mother-in-law, girlfriend. You can see that they're all caricatures. So ramp shape tuning in face cells means that face processing involves within category comparison. You can't tell whether a face has bigger inter eye distances than average unless you measure the distance compared to the average. So it means that face processing is local and opponent. What do I mean by it's local and opponent? Well, I told you that in early visual cortex, as you go across cortex, you go across visual space. So nearby neurons care about the same part of visual space. As you go across temporal cortex, where we have face cells, you don't go across visual space. What you go across is categories. So first you'll have cells that are all clustered together that code faces. And then you go farther away and you get into a different object category. So that means that nearby cells are all coding faces. So that means that face space should be opponent, not spatially, but within face space. So I'm going to show you opponency in face space. And while I do this, I want you to look at those little numbers. And the reason I want you to keep looking at those little numbers is because I want you to get an after image, an opponent after image, not a stupid local retinal after image, but a high level face identity after image. OK, so now, after you've adapted, I am going to show you two identical morphs. And I hope you got an identity after image, very high level. They're identical. So 
Vision is information processing, not image transmission. You can see this in the work of many artists because artists take advantage of the ways our visual systems process information. You can even see this in the artwork of children. If you ask a three-year-old child to draw a person, you will get a face on legs. Any three-year-old child, you will get a face on legs. The child is telling you what information he has extracted about an individual's identity, what's important about a person, their face. And this is a drawing I got of that a th child drew of her pregnant mother. It's a face on legs inside a face on legs. And Matisse said this explicitly. He said, I don't paint things, I paint the differences between things. So I get invited sometimes to very strange meetings. And one of the stranger meetings I got invited to was a meeting at the Museum of Art and Design on dioramas. Do you guys know what dioramas are? Like it's when kids make scenes in shoeboxes and take them into fifth grade and stuff. And I didn't want to go at first because I didn't think I had anything to say about dioramas, but I went and I was fascinated. There were these little images, little constructions of scenes that you would ordinarily find either not interesting or even unpleasant, and yet they were exquisite. And you talk to the artists, which is what I was there for, was to talk to the artists, and what they kept saying was, I'm trying to get the viewer to see this differently. Now, I spend a lot of effort trying to understand what artists are saying. It's not that they're not articulate, it's that they use different language than I do, because I'm a neuroscientist, right? I finally figured out what they were saying. They really were getting the viewer to look at it differently. They had discovered something important about the way we see places. So let me go back to the agnosias, you get an agnosia, not being able to recognize something, if you have a lesion in your temporal lobe, in your what pathway. But you can get surprisingly specific kinds of agnosias. So there are people who lose the ability to recognize just small objects, or just places, or just faces, or just text. So that means there must be a particular part of your temporal lobe dedicated to processing each of these object categories. Now these are object categories that we are expert at processing. That is, we're much better at any, than any computer program could be. Now you know what this, this is you, you are processing these two f images with your non-face, non-expert cortex. And I, I know you're doing that because this doesn't, these don't qualify as intact, upright faces. Now, you know what I've done, right? This is an old illusion. It was invented by, in 1980 by, by Peter Thompson. It's called the Margaret Thatcher illusion because he first did it with Margaret Thatcher. But you are not processing these with your expert cortex. Despite how cognitive and intellectual you are and you know what I've done, you are not processing this with your face cortex, and now you will. And I hope you're surprised by how this looks. I always am, even though I've seen it hundreds of times. Now you're processing it with your face cortex, with your expert cortex. So if something doesn't qualify as one of these object categories because it's not the right orientation or not the right scale, then you process it literally with a different part of your brain. And that's what these artists are achieving by changing the scale of what they've made. They're getting you to see it with a different part of your brain. They are literally getting you to see it differently. That's been going on for a long time. Even putting something in the wrong place gets you to see it differently. So remember, so now you're seeing this again with your non-face part of your cortex. And despite the fact that you know exactly what I've done, it looks different, doesn't it? Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about in four minutes is stereopsis. 
you're, it's the last of your, of your abilities to see things in two dimension, three dimensions. So now I want you to look at these with both eyes open, blue on the right. And some of you, not all of you, don't worry about it, will see these as more three-dimensional when you use the glasses with blue on the right. And if you do it the other way around, it'll get messed up. So don't do that, okay? So stereopsis is just geometry. If you're looking at this object, it casts images on corresponding parts of your two retinas. But things that are closer or farther away cast images on non-corresponding parts of your retina. And your visual system uses these tiny differences in the two images in your two eyes to, as part of its computation of distance and depth. So if you go to a museum and you see a painting where the artist has made a lot of effort to create a sense of three-dimensionality using perspective and shading, if you look at this painting with both eyes open, your stereo is contradicting all the depth cues the artist put in the painting. So if you want to see a painting as more three-dimensional, close one eye. And then, but you have to be standing right in front of it and has to fill your visual field. But close one eye next time you're at a museum and see if the painting doesn't look more three-dimensional. But stereo matching is computationally quite difficult. So without your glasses, if I tell you that blue is white to your right eye and red is white to your left eye, can you see what this shows? This is easy, right? Ah, you're cheating. OK, use your glasses, and your visual system will solve this problem much faster than you can. Blue on the right. If you want to do it hard, blue on the left, and it goes in. But in any case, many of you will see an image that you cannot see with either eye alone. But stereo matching is difficult. If you have four identical objects in the real world, this is the correct match. But if you match the fourth one in your right eye with the third one in your left eye, this one, it corresponds to the same object, but just at a dis different distance or depth. So if you've ever misstepped on an escalator, you do that because the slats in an escalator can misfuse in your two eyes and correspond to the step being in the wrong place. And I think, think the Impressionists, who said they were painting the air, and the Post-Impressionists can achieve a sense of depth by having these speckles that can be mismatched in your two eyes, corresponding to a volume of speckly stuff. And this painting, which I don't like to look at because I find it a little too three-dimensional, because you can mismatch the, the leaves in your two eyes. But what's fun about this painting is that Klimt, the guy who made it, did not have stereopsis. How do I know he didn't have stereopsis? Can anybody see? He's cross-eyed. He's severely cross-eyed. So as I mentioned, these computations about distance and depth occur in early visual cortex, where the visual field is systematically mapped across the cortex. If your eyes are not lined up, you don't have the same part of the visual field in the same part of cortex. So you can't compute stereopsis if your eyes are not lined up. So 10% of otherwise normal people have no stereopsis. And I got interested in the question of artistic talent and poor depth perception when I did some experiments with people with dyslexia. So dyslexia is a selective problem in learning to read. It's a, what we call a learning disability. There's people of normal intelligence, normal education, who have a terrible time learning to read. And they often complain that black and white text has this same jumpy, nasty, jittery quality that what I find equiluminant text has. And so we did some experiments to measure the, the function of the different visual subdivisions of the visual system in people with dyslexia. And we discovered a very slight slowing of the wear system in people with dyslexia. And remember, what does the wear system do? Motion, depth, spatial organization, and figure ground segregation? Well, there are other symptoms in dyslexia besides problems learning to read. People have trouble with positional information, figure ground problems, and trouble gauging distance and depth. Just the same thing that your wear system is responsible for. So in doing these studies, I was privileged to meet a number of people with dyslexia. And many of them were very talented artists, musicians, actors, and computer programmers. It was inescapable. So. The, there's 
probably different subdivisions of the auditory system as well. So hearing the difference between ba and da, or ball and bell, may be something that people with a slight timing difference in their auditory system may have. Ba and da happens in 40 milliseconds. So that may explain why so many people with dyslexia become musicians. They're not good at phonetics, which are fast auditory transitions, but they're really good at music, which is slow auditory transitions. But I work on vision, so why should there be so many dyslexics among the artists? It's been documented that dyslexics are overrepresented in the art artistic population. And the usual explanation is that they were no good at academic subjects, so they spent all their time in the art room. But some of these people were so talented, I started thinking, well, maybe there's something about dyslexia that makes them really good at being an artist. How about something as stupid as the fact that they have trouble gauging distance and depth? So if you've ever tried to draw a chair, most people have a lot of tr trouble, I have a terrible time, getting rid of the three-dimensional information that my visual system has extracted, and I can't flatten that chair again. I have no access to my low-level retinal image. So maybe a kid who sees the world as flatter than other kids is better at drawing, just from the get-go. So we looked at some famous artists. This is Chuck Close. His two eyes have different magnification. His two glass lenses have different magnification. He's severely dyslexic, and he says he sees the world as flat. So you can tell if somebody's eyes are lined up by looking where the light reflection is in their two eyes. And if it's in exactly the same place in the two eyes, your eyes are lined up, and you could have normal stereopsis. This is a clinical test called the Hirschberg test. So here are some baseball players. You can see that the light reflex is in exactly the same place in their two eyes. OK, so are you good at this yet? You got it? You look at the light reflex. There is one baseball player who had no stereopsis. Light reflex is centered on this eye. It's off. So Babe Ruth had amblyopia. If your eyes are not lined up when you're a kid, you can either suppress the input from one eye, in which case the connections to the brain go away and you be, have very poor vision in that eye, or you can alternate. And that's called an alternating strabismic. So 3% of people have misaligned eyes. I told you 10% of people have, normal, have no stereopsis, but only 3% of people have uh, severely misaligned eyes, which is why they have no stereopsis. So we got a hold of a bunch of photographs of famous artists, and you'd expect we would have found a few out of 100. Instead, we found like 16%. Here's Andrew Wyeth. This eye is looking over here. This eye is looking at you. His father was also an illustrator, was also strabismic. Edward Hopper, light reflexes next to his pupil here, on the edge of the eye here. Carol Walker. Her light reflects in completely different places. She works in silhouettes, totally flat. I don't know about the dog. <laughs> Mark Chagall was cross-eyed. Frank Stella was cross-eyed. Jasper Johns was wall-eyed. Robert Rauschenberg was wall-eyed and severely dyslexic. Alexander Calder. Man Ray, Frank Lloyd Wright. Now, I told you it is a legitimate clinical test to use a photograph to diagnose strabismus. I know you aren't supposed to diagnose strabismus from a painting, but there is a room at the Louvre, or at least it was 20 years ago, where there are four Rembrandt self-portraits. In all four of them, one eye is looking straight ahead and the other eye is deviating off to the side. And I know you use a mirror to make a self-portrait. You look to the right to look at your right eye, you look to your left to look at your left eye. So here's a montage of me looking at my right eye about, with a mirror about six inches from my face, and here I'm looking at my left eye. And even though I have stereopsis, the light reflexes in two different places but my eyes are not nearly as deviated as Rembrandt portrays himself. So I had a young colleague who came to my office and saw all these portraits of Rembrandt. I had piled on my desk and he said, is it always the same eye? And I said, no, if it were, I could publish it. Sometimes it's the eye on this side that deviates and sometimes it's the eye on this side that deviates. Happily, my junior colleague was an artist, and he said, Marge, you have to separate the paintings and the etchings. 
And when we did, we discovered that in the paintings, it's the eye on this side that deviates. In the etchings, it's always the eye on this side. To make an etching, you scratch a plate and then you flip it over, right? So <clears throat> we measured these, we measured the eye and the iris in these paintings and etchings and discovered that there was a systematic pattern whereby in the paintings, it was always the eye on the right that was centered and the eye on the left that deviated. And in the etchings, it was the reverse. So Rembrandt was not just doing something stylistic because if he were just trying to achieve a look, he would have always had the same eye deviate. Instead, he was probably just drawing what he saw. Now, if you want your kid to be a good artist, uh, you don't have to poke out an eye because the first thing you learn in drawing class is close one eye. So these are, all, these are my conclusions. And the only important one is to, could you leave the stereo glasses on a table outside when you leave? And now somebody's going to challenge me, I think, right? Yes.